I'm Ken Beatty, and I'm a writer. I'm traveling the world looking for relationships between people and plants. We all know how important plants are to our lives. They give us medicine, shelter, clothing, and foods. They even give us some of our favorite drinks. Since the beginning of time, people have made some of the most intoxicating romantic beverages from plants. We'll travel to the French Mediterranean coast, and here we'll meet a young winemaker who is producing a unique wine found only in this part of the world. But first, England, where one of the world's oldest alcoholic drinks is experiencing a revival. It's called mead. Now, long before there was wine, even before there was beer, the Stone Age people in Britain had mead. It's an alcoholic drink made by fermenting honey in water. I arrived in Warwickshire, a farm community near Stratford-on-Avon, just north of London, and here I met John Holmes. John is a local beekeeper. In order to make mead, you need a good crop of fresh honey. Now, what flowers make the, make the best honey? <laughs> Everybody has a different view on this because you take me to a delicatessen cheese counter, I would probably choose different cheeses to you. But I love orchard honey, um, and very often the early honeys off the cherries, plums, apples, pears, has also got some dandelion honey in it because of the grass uh, passed between the ap apple trees. Much of John's honey comes from the blossoms of the orchards in the area. Old-fashioned apple trees, sycamore trees, elderberries, and common linden known as lime trees to the British. John sells his honey directly to shoppers at local markets. Some of his crop goes to the mead maker, and what's left over to his own homemade mead. Does it matter what, what flour is used for making honey for mead? Uh, no, no, you can use a light flowery honey, light flowery, or you can use a dark, strong honey for mead. Depends on what you want, to, what you want a dry mead, a sweet mead, heavy tasting mead. The art of mead making was passed on through the centuries. It was not only popular in the castles of the kings, but also in the cottages of country families. Back at John's home, he showed me his method of making this ancient beverage. Well, I have a bucket which is currently being made. As I say, when you ask me, I, I do really make it all the year round. Now, we take the filters cloths. You, you'd like to have a... Don't uh, get too near it. Might... <laughs> well, I noticed that the, the top of the bucket was kind yes, of bubbly. <laughs> that, that, that shows me that it's still fermenting, you see. It's working. But do smell, look. Oh, that smells um, floral, I think, would be the mm. term I'd use. But what's the, this is your filter? Yes, this is, this is purely a honey filter, which we filtered the honey through. And all, all it's done, it's, it's just rinsed and worked. So you've got like a must. All right. See? Just like making homemade wine or yes. something like that. Um, I mean, I could do the same thing if I took some jars of honey and tipped the honey into water and, and stirred it, but I'm trying to use the last bit of honey which is left in the filter. It seems a shame to waste it. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, I had this romantic notion of Shakespeare <laughs> and wonderful mead, and, uh, and here you have it in a plastic bucket with an old hunk of rag stuffed in there. <laughs> You're making your own mead. Oh, a little sample. All, That's all, pretty good. All I want is the honey the water and a yeast, and I've got mead. Like John, early mead makers were simple in their approach to making this drink. He says it was like a local ale, high in protein. It was a good food source for the humble folks living in cottages. The richer gentry, however, drank mead with more alcohol in it because they could afford to leave the mead ferment a little bit longer. I'm just going to pour it gently because it's still not really ready. Oh, it's a pretty color, though, isn't it? It's a very pale me, this one, and I'm sure that we shall... There we are. You, you, you... Okay. I'll, I'll wait. I'm going to say you were here. Well, if, if we do nothing else, we could say cheers to each other. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh, that's very dry. To, to, to the dry meat, yeah. One, one where you sort of taste it further back. Mm, Almost I'd try that again, I think, don't you? <laughs> no, no. You don't need an excuse. <laughs> Mead making is becoming popular again in farm communities around here. John says in his home, they've started to drink one or two bottles a week, and he's saving a particular vat for a special occasion. We've got some mead um, put to one side, which is quite old, which uh, is promised for uh, my daughter's wedding if she ever gets married. <laughs> so if she doesn't, I don't know when we're going to use it, but we'll have to find an excuse, won't we? 
Mead is turning up at many modern-day Elizabethan festivals celebrating the past. One such place where the past is explored, relived and enjoyed is here, Colehurst Manor. The house was built in the year 1690, and historians say it was a wedding gift for a favourite grandson. Today it's home to a Norwegian Bjorn Teknes and his wife Maria and their little daughter Juliet. Together they offer vacation weekends at Colehurst Manor for people who want to experience life in the 17th century. And that wouldn't be complete, of course, without serving mead. We try to do everything to detail right. And without mead, the 17th century is not right. It is kind of like we use knives and forks with two prong forks to, to, to eat with and, and slip wear too. And as you saw the glasses, you taste it off. It's really then green glass made, handmade for the surgeon. And in the food, Maria, that's, mead is very important. People from all over the world come here. They dress in 17th century clothes for the weekend, eat 17th century meals prepared by Maria, and drink mead. The mead is provided by the brewing company Meads of Mercier, owned by Jeff Morris. Jeff gets his honey from John Holmes. Nice to see you again. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah. What have you got here for me then? I've got uh, some of the. The two products. have become good friends yeah. since the first time they met five years ago. He turned up at a food show in Birmingham with a rucksack on his back, and I thought, oh, what have we got here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and he produced little bottles, it looked like sample bottles, and I don't, they don't, I think the last time I saw them like that, they were in hospitals. Um, uh, and he said, I'm trying to, you, to make mead, and I want to make it commercially. If I'm successful, will you supply me? And Jeff has been successful. He's quit his full-time job as a science teacher to become a professional mead maker. He says his love of brewing mead stems from his interest in the historic uses of alcohol. Mead played an important part in the, in, in the religious rituals. Uh, the, the, the shaman of the, of the times would, would go, would, would, drink, would drink the mead first and then go, and then in his uh, enhanced state would be able to make all the prophecies and the prophetic utterances which his culture uh, which his culture demanded of him. And a lot of that was done um, under the influence of, uh, of mead. Jeff makes five different kinds of mead. His most ancient recipe is a mead flavored with lime flowers. Others are flavored with ginger, blueberries, or apple cider. His bottles sell anywhere from five pounds to 50 pounds sterling each. Maria and Bjorn are two of Jeff's best mead customers. We serve it up as a reception drink because they, they do like to try it. And uh, when they come in, they have their either mulled mead or their um, mead straight from the bottle. This is the one that's flavoured with lime flour. And it's very odd because you can smell the honey and taste the honey. Thank you. But it's not sweet. It's quite an, uh, unusual. Mm. Is this one you've had here before? Mm. Mm. I like this one. Mm. I know quite a few of my guests feel it's a little bit too dry for them because um, most commercial meads are quite sweet. Mm -hmm. But this is very good with, um, with fish. You know, I can almost smell the lime flowers. I'm very yes. fond of mm. that smell. Not only is meat a wonderful accompaniment to medieval and modern day cuisine alike, it's been attributed to other very special qualities, like the origin of the honeymoon. <laughs> you know the story of honeymoon? No, well, and I mean, maybe as a Norwegian, I tell a little bit too rude, so I think it's right. <laughs> I think we should leave that to the English to tell you properly. <laughs> Mead was the traditional drink at, uh, at weddings where the bride and groom were given a glass of mead on the, on the first night of their marriage. And, uh, every, and every night for the, first, for the first month of their marriage before they went to bed. And, uh, and this period was, was called the honeymoon. They'd got nowhere to go and there wasn't much else to do. And so the honey was supposed to contain an aphrodisiac, which was probably what uh, help in getting the marriage off to a successful start. We tasted and drank mead well into the night. And you know, 
The more I tasted, the more I could appreciate its many flavors. The subtle scent of the honey, the spices and the blossoms, all provided by the plant world and passed down through the ages. This is very good. Okay, this is, the, this is a sizer. This is cider apples and honey fermented together. An authentic 17th century recipe, except that I left out the dead rabbit. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. When we come back, we're going to the Mediterranean coast of France, where the Black Grenache grape produces a wine found nowhere else but here. On the Mediterranean coast of France, nestled in a small bay near the city of Perpignan, is the winery called Le Clos de Pailly. Surrounding the winery are very old vineyards growing the Black Grenache grape, a rich grape that makes a unique wine called Bagnus. Bagnus is a port dessert wine brewed only in this region. The winery is owned by the Doré family. The winemaker and the manager of the business is Estelle Doré. So are you one of the very few women vintners? Here, the only one. You're the only one? <laughs> oui. Well, it's, you know, we are on the Mediterranean. And on the Mediterranean, it's a male tradition. Women are at the kitchen or with the kids. And, and how, are you, uh, how are you treated within the business then? No, very good, because, you know, I started uh, not being winemaker. I started watching. So they know me for 10 years. And when, when I started really taking the decisions, mm -hmm. they were used to me. Estelle is five months pregnant with her first child. But that's not slowing her down or stopping her from getting involved in every aspect of making vanules. Once a week, uh, we make a tour of the vineyards to see, you know, about treatments and if there is any disease, any particular things to do uh, the next week. Mm -hmm. And then uh, once a year also I do the harvest, you know, but just half a day uh, because when I am there they have such a motivation that uh, <laughs> half a day is like three days. <laughs> the black Grenache grape used to make banyus grow on 80-year-old vines. The older the vine, the better the grape. The grapes are always harvested by hand, partly to protect the old vines and the quality of the grapes, but also because the terrain is so difficult. The vines grow on very rocky, steep cliffs. Estelle says one of the most important decisions she has in winemaking is knowing when the grape is ready to pick. Most of the people, when they decide on maturity, they only look at the sugar content of the berry and the acidity. So the sugar is going up, the acidity is going down, and they think that maybe at this level, it's okay, they harvest. But from my point of view, it's a little bit more complicated. You have also to weight the berries. So you weight each time 100 berries, and you see the weight going up with concentration. It's going up, 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 and then it's reaching a time of a few days where it's stable, it's stable and then it's going down. If you harvest when it's going down, you have lost all the aromas. So you have to harvest when it's here. Another thing uh, that is quite important and that looks completely stupid is to taste, you know. Your palate in, in when you make wine is your number one tool. Le Clos de Pauly is an old winery. It's here that Banyus is made. It's a simple procedure using very little modern technology. When the grapes arrive from the vineyards, they're dumped into large vats. Here they're slightly crushed, stems and all. They're left in a large tank to begin fermentation. During fermentation, a neutral grape spirit is added and the mixture is left for another six weeks. After that, it's pressed to remove the solids from the liquid. Then the wine is put in a tank to breathe. Banyus is aged three different ways on this coastal winery. In a bottle, in a barrel, or in the bonbon. I've never seen this before. I, I would call this a corral. Th those are called bonbon. Bonbon? Bonbon. Uh, bonbon is the glass mm -hmm. continent. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's probably the only place in the world where we age wine like that. Mm -hmm. After the winemaking, the aging. Uh, so when you do the aging, you have different options, of course. Uh, a part of it will be bottled maybe in six months from now, but directly from the tank to the bottle. And it will give a very fruity, easy, pleasant wine. Then a part of it will be aged two years in barrel. 
It will give more complexity, you know, it, the, ta the tannins will be rounder and the aromas will be more dry fruits and a little bit of spices. And here we age the wine two winters and one summer in those bonbons. The family winery produces some 200,000 bottles of wine a year, but only 10%, about 20,000 bottles, will be labelled with the family's name. It's maybe a little bit pretentious, but uh, when you put your name on, on, on a bottle of wine and when your ambition is to be number one, uh, you have to put your name only on the best. For 20 years at the Doré Winery, this man has had his name featured on many special vintages of wine. He's Robert Dutre, and he used to be the man in charge here, the winemaker. Today he has a new job, teaching Estelle everything he knows. He describes Estelle's first summer of work. When your papa fait part de votre intention de venir travailler sur la propriété, il m'a dit, je vous la confie. <laughs> Robert said he knew early on that Estelle was the right person to take over and make the family's famous banyuls. He has the reputation of having a very bad character, you know, very hard character. And, and he thinks that it's very compulsory in this, uh, in this job to have a very bad uh, character. <laughs> and I have a very bad character too. <laughs> he doesn't have to say it, I know. <laughs> a bad character is not the only thing that Robert and Estelle have in common. You know, we have a little committee of tasting, we are five people, and Robert and I always, always, always agree on the tasting. You know, we always prefer the same wines, we are always with the same opinion, so that's a, uh, a good sign. I mean, we, we have at the beginning the same taste, or I have his taste. I took it from him. <laughs> when we come back, Estelle teaches me how to taste banyus. For 20 years, the Doré family has called this home. It's the Chateau de Jo, an 18th century mansion close to the winery. Estelle grew up here, surrounded by 90 acres of vineyards. It's no wonder she's taken to winemaking so naturally. Estelle, this must be the most interesting part of the job. <laughs> Drinking, <laughs> tasting, tasting it, tasting it. Uh, no, I, I don't know an awful lot about venues or, or wines in general. So You'll I... know more in five minutes. When you taste dry wines, you taste white and then reds. With sweet wines, you taste red and then whites. We are going to taste only sweet wines. Mm -hmm. If you smell like that... Put your nose right in. It's the first nose. Then you shake the glass. Mm -hmm. So you make the wine breeze with oxygen, and there is going to be more flavors, you know. With more oxygen? Mm-hmm. It's going to be stronger. I don't want to spill it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you, you need to practice, 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 practice a practice. little bit. Okay, there, and then, all right. You know what happened with me all the time when I was young in, no. the, in the business? That I, I put my nose in the wine each time. You right Yeah, <laughs> each time. <laughs> That is marvelous. And now I think I understand round because I can still taste it on the, on the very back of my tongue. The taste of a good wine should stay in your mouth for five minutes after you've sipped it. Now you'll notice you hold the glass by the stem. Yeah, because if you hold it like that, you, you are going to heat the wine, you know. Oh, and temperature hand. is something also extremely important. So the, these sweet wines, the Banyuls, is, is at room temperature? And room temperature is uh, something that people used to say in the 17th century when the heat was not <laughs> on. <laughs> All right, so. So it's 17 degrees. Room temperature usually is 17 degrees maximum. Yes. Uh, when people, you know, put the bottle in the kitchen mm -hmm. uh, to have it room temperature, they make a big mistake because they're going to have a wine at 22, 25 degrees, and that's always too much. Well, there's something. Now look. The it sticks to the glass. Legs. Legs? We call it the legs of the, of the wine. What does that mean? So when they are very large and just a few, mm -hmm. it means that uh, the wine is very fat when, once again. <laughs> and very often it's related to the alcohol. The, the more alcohol you have, the more um, dense will be the legs on the, on the glass. Okay. It's no doubt these wines are pleasurable to the palate. I asked Estelle how grapes that grow in such rocky soil could produce such tasty wines. 
The vine is probably one of the plants that really likes to suffer. So if you put it in very hard conditions, it would give the best, you know, uh, it would give you the best uh, grape uh, it can give. So when you look around us, uh, here the soil is especially hard for vineyard. <laughs> Plus we have the Mediterranean, so a big influence from the sea. She says learning to make wine is about learning how to adapt to nature and doing the best she can with what she's given. Chin. And Estelle was right. I did learn a lot about wine in five minutes. I drank a lot of wine in five minutes too. A lot more than Estelle did, I'm sure. So I needed a little walk. We went to the vine-covered cliffs above the winery, overlooking the sea. Estelle spoke about how much her father and Robert had helped her to be a good winemaker. I asked her what scares her the most about her responsibilities. Nothing. <laughs> I'm sorry. What? No, but, no, but no scared. No, I, I don't see any reason why I should be scared. Sometimes I am frustrated, you know, because I wanted to do something and I didn't reach, reach my, my goal. Uh, so it's much about frustration than, than fears. She says she hopes her children might follow in her footsteps of brewing the black Grenache grape into Banyos. But for now, her aspirations are focused on her 16-year-old niece. Very, very happy with it. Why are you happy she's oh. a girl? Tell me that. Tell me more. Uh, with two women, we can say anything. It will not change the fact that you're working together and that you're friends. With a man, you know, you have to uh, take it like that and like that and like that. We're, it's more complicated. We're special gloves, eh? <laughs> Especially if you're a woman giving orders to men, you have to be very prudent, you know. If you are, do this and that, they don't accept it from you. I'd say that Estelle is extremely prudent. A determined, knowledgeable winemaker whose product has to be good or she won't put her name on it. She told me there's no magic to making an excellent bad news. It's really all in the grape. A good grape makes a good wine. As I look back over my trip and recall the many glasses of both mead and banyus I enjoyed, I'm reminded of the years of tradition that goes into creating these wines. Wines that not only satisfy our taste buds and can be intoxicating if you drink too much, but wines that require a knowledge and appreciation of the plant life that contributes to their magical qualities. Another way plants enrich our lives. I'm Ken Beattie. Join me again next time to continue our journey through the Earth's Garden.